Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Let's start with this feminist assembly. And I would like to say that uh, to me, it's a honor to be here to see known faces and to uh, hold uh, a feminist assembly at this face-to-face uh, -face forum after the COVID pandemic and after the assembly that we uh, uh, held last year. Last year's assembly was uh, very successful, but uh, we lacked uh, to be all together to be able to touch each other and to take care uh, of each other. The topic is, uh, as you may know, uh, about uh, the rise of the far right in Europe and how this rise is affecting to women's rights and uh, the lives of women. And um, we are going to discuss about what we should do in the, the leftist parties uh, to uh, fight against this uh, rise that uh, affects uh, women's rights. In order to uh, organize this debate, uh, we are going to have uh, two parts. First of all, we will uh, raise awareness about uh, women's rights and how they are questioned. They are always fragile, and especially when uh, there is such a rise of uh, far right and right parties. In uh, some countries, uh, we uh, witness that uh, these uh, parties have uh, in common uh, an opposed agenda to uh, the uh, conquer of women. And we have to explain uh, all these topics related to what I have explained. So we are going to tackle these topics and the situation and how our rights are um, questioned. And then there will be a second uh, section uh, related to all these policies addressed uh, to equality matters, uh, equality between uh, men and women across Europe. And we would like to give visibility to all these policies that are enforced in the countries where far-right parties are not so important. We can give visibility, as I was mentioning, that uh, to to the fact that uh, well in germany uh, the, the far right party wants to uh, end uh, with uh, the um, um, with the rights of of um, gays or or in poland uh, we have uh, all this discussion about the penalization of uh, the abortion or in Hungary, there is a substantial opposition to the Istanbul Convention. Or in Spain, we have the box of far right party. And uh, so for you to know what is going on in my country, in, on the 25th of November, uh, we organized uh, many demonstrations across Europe. In spite of the pandemic, we were protesting in the streets because the feminist movement uh, has been reinforced and it's here to stay. And let's be clear, this feminist movement is going to stay among us. We have to uh, create more alliances and more synergies because uh, if we are stronger as a feminist movement, uh, the far right and right parties are weakened. Well, without uh, further ado, 
I would like to give the floor to some panelists who are going to describe different situations. And in the end, we should launch a campaign against uh, far right and right parties. And why? Because I will repeat it. The rise of far right and right parties means uh, curtailing our rights as women. On the 25th of November, the far right party called uh, Vox uh, issued a document in which it was stated that domestic violence didn't exist. And how can we deny that uh, there is uh, such a violence? There are feminicides across the world, and we are victims of all kinds of violence because we are women. So no reason to, uh, no need to explain more. So in this first part, We have with us two colleagues. They are activists, they are feminists. They come from Mexico. So with us, there is Michelle Urquiza. She's a student, she's an activist uh, and member of Sorority Without Borders. To my right, I have Clara Serra who's a lawyer uh, on human rights matters, and she's a member of the association Stop Violence in Andorra. And uh, on Zoom, we will have uh, uh, our Argentinian colleague, who is Florencia Urquicia, who belongs to the Juanita Moro organization and who has been uh, fighting for the right to abortion in her country. Now it's your turn, Michelle. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, let me uh, first say that I am extremely happy to be here with you today and to be involved in this uh, Women's Assembly. My name is Michelle. I am uh, Mexican. I have been now living in Brussels for four years, and I want to share with you the uh, uh, experience, my experience of uh, how far-right ideology can affect the life of women, uh, and, and I share my personal uh, experience of that. Because when we talk about extreme right or far right, what are we talking about exactly? We uh, usually associate far right with ultra liberalism and uh, being Mexican, I can tell you that Mexico is an extremely uh, uh, unfair country. Uh, the um, minimum wage is 200 euros a month uh, for 50 hours of work uh, and two weeks, 50 hours a week and two uh, weeks of holiday uh, a year. We do not have access to water, or if we have access to water, water is extremely expensive. And in certain cases, water is not even really accessible. And the only thing you can buy is Coca-Cola. So imagine uh, access to education or access to health if you do not even have access to water. Mexico is uh, uh, an extremely violent country, uh, particularly uh, against women. 3,723 women were killed in 2020 in Mexico. And that is uh, the, the visible face of extreme right and far right parties. We also say that uh, far right parties are usually nationalist, while they are racist in Mexico, they call me uh, white face. Uh, I look like uh, a white woman to them because I have access to uh, work, I have access to education, and uh, I am not white here. I am uh, dark skinned, and uh, having access to work here is equally difficult as it is for dark-skinned Mexican women in Mexico. The women in Mexico that try to be activists often are uh, discriminated, uh, uh, discriminated on the basis of their skin color, on the basis of the way they dress, on the basis of their accent, nationality, or social class. Or because you have migrated abroad and you are a 
women who has migrated. And we migrate because we need uh, to be free and safe from violence. And we migrate because we want to survive and tell a story. We want to migrate or we have to migrate because we uh, are trying to build uh, our own personal identity uh, abroad sometimes. And uh, migrants like myself, uh, often have no other option because migrating for us means running away from danger. Imagine uh, what it means to run away from uh, violence. Imagine what it takes to leave everything, to leave your family, to leave uh, everything you've ever had in life uh, and finding yourself uh, in a different country. I still face discrimination. I still face today other types of abuse. And some of us migrate to run away, but also to learn, to educate themselves, uh, or some of them unfortunately migrate to become exploited. And that is what it means uh, to be a migrant. All these aspects are in my mind any time I cross a border. And every time I cross a border, I think about all of that. And every time I feel fear, uh, extreme right and far right, what is it? Who is it? Well. We say that the far right is ultra conservative and uh, the ultra right hates me. I'm 31 years old and I'm single. They hate me because I was living without being married uh, in a, a, a relationship. Uh, they hate me because I am still married. Sorry, I am married still with a man who is Belgian, but we have split. And if I divorce from that man, my rights will be drastically reduced, and I may actually be told that I have to leave the country. The ultra right also hates me because I had an abortion. I am extremely uh, upset. I was extremely upset uh, uh, when people tried to convince me that I shouldn't abort. And uh, they showed me extremely violent videos of fetuses being dismembered. But I don't feel guilty of anything. I was able to have my voice heard and to uh, uh, now, you know, tell this story so that other women uh, uh, do not have to go through what I've gone through. And I don't want women to die because they have to abort illegally. I'm also uh, here to talk about uh, the fact that the body of a woman is still something that is constricted, limited, or bound by barriers. We hear a lot of stories, uh, uh, stories of people fighting against racism, against slavery, against exploitation, and against capitalistic exploitation. And I think this is exactly what uh, why I'm here. Uh, I want more empathy, more uh, equality, more humanity. Uh, I am asking uh, for more visibility also uh, of women. I am asking you to help us build uh, that other uh, reality. And I want you uh, to feel accountable and to show that you are responsible also for uh, this, this, this solidarity that we need globally. So all of us who are trying to fight uh, to defend rights, all of us that are trying to uh, keep on fighting, please uh, hear me. Uh, I am here. We are here and we are not alone. We are not afraid and we will continue uh, making sure that our voices are heard and we'll continue the, the fight. Thank you. Clara, you have the floor. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Clara Serra. And uh, with us, uh, there is the president of uh, Stop Violence Andorra, who is Vanessa Cortez. Uh, she will be with us and uh, she may intervene. I'm a lawyer uh, in the field of uh, human rights, and I work for Stop Violence in Andorra, in my country. This is the first uh, um, body which has been uh, professionalized, and it's an independent body from uh, uh, the uh, government of Andorra. We uh, 
are uh, focused uh, in the prevention uh, of uh, violence. And we accompany all those uh, women who have uh, been uh, raped and want to uh, abort. We um, draft reports that we later on uh, submit to other international and national bodies. So we work at the local level, but also in the international arena. We have a very uh, vast uh, feminist network. We work with colleagues from uh, France, uh, Catalonia, and Spain, in Portugal, and in Argentina. I'm going to... Um, um, speak about the following points. First of all, I would like to set the social and political background of Andorra. And more specifically, I would like to talk about how right parties are, are undermining the statal structures in Andorra. Secondly, I would like to talk about the right to abortion in Andorra. And uh, to conclude, I will describe the situation of uh, the um, uh, feminist uh, left in Andorra as a consequence of the political situation we are experiencing now. If you may have visited Andorra or if you have um, heard about uh, uh, the country located uh, between France and Spain, you will know that uh, yeah, it's a tourist, uh, a tourist destination, but you may not know about the political situation we are now facing. Andorra is a member uh, of the UN, but we don't belong to the European Union. At first time, it would seem that the international treaties have been ratified by my country. But if we go uh, deeper, uh, women who has been a victim of tortures or rape or any kind of torture uh, cannot gain access to submit a complaint to uh, the Committee for Torture of United Nations because Andorra hasn't ratified the international treaty. And it hasn't uh, ratified the international treaty for the social rights or uh, forced disparition. Andorra has uh, indeed ratified the international treaties related to freedom of association or assembly, but in practice uh, they are inexistent, as we will uh, see. So the political context uh, nowadays uh, is as follow. We have the uh, uh, um, Democratas de Andorra political party in power. They consider themselves to be a center party, but the thing is that uh, um, we are a particular country. So uh, um, our country is um, a country which was created in the 13th century. So the political power is divided between the president of the French Republic, who is Mr. Macron, and the Archbishop of the Seo d'Urgell. So we have two co-prints as yeah, Andorra is a parliamentary democracy, and these uh, two uh, authorities are the chiefs of state. And it will seem that uh, they have a symbolical uh, um, role, but uh, the Archbishop of the Seo d'Urgell has uh, curtailed uh, women's rights and rights in general. Beyond uh, the uh, party in power, we have uh, the Socialist Party, which uh, belongs to the opposition. And uh, nowadays, we don't have uh, any space left for uh, um, a more uh, leftist party. Regarding the social context and the fight of uh, women, um, our situation has been uh, marked uh, by the uh, right uh, uh, party. So in the 60s, uh, the feminist movement starts to walk, but uh, we see that uh, 
this is a classist feminist. Uh, so there are many women who define themselves uh, as non-feminist. And um, I will add that the civil space is uh, very limited in the, the streets. Uh, we don't see many demonstrations, although my uh, organization, which is Stop Violence, uh, is very active and we have been protesting for years, but uh, the streets are not considered an area for uh, demonstrations. And now let's talk about abortion in Andorra. The article 109 of the uh, um, criminal code um, bans uh, abortion for all these women who wants to um, uh, abort in my country. And so um, the woman and the doctor who practice uh, this abortion will be punished. Uh, when women under 18 years uh, are not allowed to um, get practice an abortion and not even when uh, the fetus um, has a malformation obviously the chef of state one of the chefs of state uh, who's the archbishop of the Seattle jail is totally opposed to abortion and he has uh, threatened uh, the citizens uh, to change the constitution in order to uh, in, uh, prevent uh, women to um, abort. Uh, we um, um, held different consultations uh, to see if we could uh, pass uh, a law on the abortion, but in 2014, the feminist movement uh, which was presented in the uh, parliament uh, left uh, the room uh, due to uh, the debate that uh, was created. So uh, now there are also people, uh, and uh, among them uh, some women, who are uh, uh, playing to, to uh, uh, play into to, uh, uh, to prevent uh, this law uh, from existing. So. In uh, Stop uh, Violence, uh, we have uh, different projects, and one of the key projects is uh, a network. This is a safety network uh, where women can be assessed if they are considering uh, to abort. Also, we have uh, close contact with different uh, Catalan organizations which support us. In Andorra, we have the CIET, which is a body to inform women, but it creates more intimidation. It curtails uh, even more the rights of women and makes uh, um, more difficult that they have the right to control their bodies. And to conclude, I would like to talk about the situation we are living in stop violence. This situation has been so since 2014, and it's a consequence of the political structure we have in my country. The government in 2020 made a complaint against Marisa Cortes, who's the president of the organization I work for. And why did it happen? Because Marisa had participated in teleprograms and had talked about uh, women's rights and the role of uh, my country. So she had uh, to face a um, difficult situation, but uh, she may be fined. She may pay uh, over 30,000 euro as a fine. Besides, um, there is a, div a campaign against her, a public campaign against her, just because she's um, defending uh, human rights and uh, the inquiry is now open. She's uh, been criminalized. She has been accused uh, to insult institutions in Andorra and the chefs of state. So one of the tasks so we are, have done 
uh, in stop violence uh, is to be in contact with uh, Amnesty International. We have been in contact with uh, the ONCT and with the service uh, of uh, human rights. We are um, asking uh, uh, the justice and the cancellation of this inquiry process, uh, which is open against Marisa and against us. And to conclude, uh, from stop violence, I will say that it's very important to raise awareness on the fact that uh, uh, the right is uh, limiting our rights. It's important uh, to guarantee freedom of expression in all uh, spheres uh, and uh, to protect people and not institutions. We have to foster social and political the arena for feminism. And um, last but not least, I would like to say that we have to uh, do more pressure. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to give the floor to our colleague from Argentina who is connected over the internet. And well, the, there has been a change in our program. The previous the person who was on the list could not participate but another person from the same organization. So the uh, organi organization Juanita Moro, who do a campaign for the national rights to abortion. You have the floor. Hello, hello to all. I hope you can hear me. I hope the sound is good. Yes, this uh, your sound is okay. Perfect, thank you. Well, firstly, I wanted to say that I am part of the national campaign for a free uh, abortion in Argentina. And just to explain where we are in Jujuy, that is quite far from the, the capital, Buenos Aires. We are a province on the frontier with Chile and Bolivia. So we're up in the north, and we want to rethink abortion, not only as, as a human right, so not only the access to a right for women, but also we believe that also need to think about the difficulties that we have in our regions, the difficulties we have as indigenous communities, and how can we reach them? And how can we, ex well, can we teach taking into account the gender equality? And these things may be unknown, but for us, this is an enormous effort because in our own province, we have many indigenous communities, as I've said, and they use a different language. And you have to give them information about a right that they basically have, but that the state is not offering them. So well, the efforts that we make is trying to bring this information that should be common knowledge So we're actually working in the periphery and something else that I wanted to explain is that we have a national campaign for the, the right to abortion, free abortion, since 2005. And only last year, 
30th of December of 2020, we were finally able to approve this law proposal. So it was a law proposal that had to survive the presidency of Mauricio Macri. And it was a political party of Vox Populi that was opposed to this law proposal. And now we live in a context in which many of the agreements have to go through the opposition of extreme rights. And you never know whether these sexual reproductive rights will be guaranteed in the future or not. For our province, for example, our governor, Geraldo Morales, is a governor who is of the right wing party that has governed us from 2015 until 2019. And we have fought for this right through manifestations, through awareness raising campaigns. And basically, because if you have a law that does not necessarily mean that this law is implemented. So we want to make sure that before the law is approved, that because what we know is that the public system, police, judges will indict a person immediately. So our public policies are protected by all of the the entire organization of our country. And many people end up demanding the rights that they already should have according to our legislation. So, and they're dangling by a thin thread because the rights that we have tried to obtain during so many years, we do not want these rights to disappear again in the future. And these rights will disappear if we don't keep on fighting for them. Because you can imagine that once a government changes, that they that a new right-wing government will try to scale back those rights. So we need to come into the streets and express our opinion. This obviously is more difficult in quarantine. In Argentina, we've been quarantined for a very long time. I believe we're one of the countries with the longest quarantine of all. So, we, together with health professionals, we have launched an enormous campaign and we've been, and we noticed that you can be prosecuted for a legal abortion done within the first 14 weeks of pregnancy and I notice that penalization is very strong. On top of that, there is a lot of critique against women who carry out an abortion. So we see that the right of youngsters, the rights of women who have the right to decide for their own sexuality, their own body in a responsible way, obviously, that these rights are not respected. And well, now obviously all of this 
makes that that many of our rights that we should have are very vulnerable to the integral sexual education which should be very transversal in public and private schools we see that this right to that sexual education is not guaranteed it's not very inclusive so we see the if there is uh, there are charges pressed against teachers who are accused of harassment that usually the victim is blamed because how was she dressed was she wearing a short skirt and in conclusion i also wanted to give you this information all of these senators who were part of the the senate on the 30th of december when this law proposal was approved they all of the senators voted negative and in the first chamber of parliament there was one abstention for the entire country of one member of parliament of our province and he said i was about to vote in favor of this law proposal but after being threatened on numerous occasions not only i but my family wanted me to abstain from voting in this law proposal so imagine the amount of pressure from the church but also from the extreme right parties they always want to regulate our productive reproductive capacity so they do not only want us to take care of our children but they want us to be baby machines we need to work and we need to produce children as we've done in the past and we should do in the future according to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we would like to hear from the audience. We have about 30 minutes for a debate. So if there are any questions or observations from the audience, please raise your hand. We're going to listen to Vanessa, a colleague from Andorra, Stop Violencias. Vanessa, yes, you have the floor first. You can hear me, right? Great. Well, my colleague from Argentina, I was listening to you and I was thinking that in Andorra, we, we've, we've had a, a similar situation in an institute and there, was, um, there were children harassing other children. I would like to thank this organization for inviting us we andorra was not on the political map when talking about reproductive rights andorra is a, a country where you go to to ski and to be in the in the mountains but we receive have a lot of temporal workers of female temporal workers from Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, Nicaragua, many women from South America and of Central America, and the government of Andorra does not have a plan to help these women in their situation so if they need health assistance, if they need an abortion. Well, there is no assistance from our government. And well, my colleague Clara had a presentation prepared 
and I believe it's very important to explain what happens when these temporary workers come to Andorra. Mm, uh, a large part of them is uh, Argentinian, so many Argentinian women. And when they come to our country, they think they will have this, the, they will have certain rights because they believe Andorra is part of the European Union, but Andorra is not even part of the Schengen area. So we are not European Union. Uh, uh, we say that Well, we see a lot. Of, um, we believe that tourists come to our region. They think it's very beautiful, etc. But they don't think about the the other side of the coin. Many sex workers who come to our region and who don't have any rights. And if you have an issue, you have to be out of the country within eight hours, so they leave you at the, the, the Spanish border. And, and there is a lot of poverty in Andorra, and you can't see it because it is hidden. Historically, the rights wing parties have always been in government, and this week we've also helped in two abortions. One of them was an abortion. Uh, a woman who had, uh, was pregnant for five months. She went to Catalonia to a public hospital, and, but they have a private wing. And uh, they had to And she had to pay for this abortion, abortion, which was 4,000 euros. And we have to do this in Catalonia because there the, the politicians need to know what is happening in their own territory. So this is a, a public hospital and it has a private wing. And due to the health policies of Spain, it could be free of charge, but this person from Andorra had to go to Catalonia in order for her to go through an abortion at five months of pregnancy. When talking about Catalonia, which is where the region, Spanish region, that is close to us. We don't have to cross the border. We have to go to Barcelona. So that's three hours of route. And women in Andorra cannot pay for an abortion. What is happening in Andorra? Is the far right is governing in coalition with two other Parties, Democratas for Andorra. You could say they're right, quite right. Then you have the liberals, which just a bit far right. And then Tercera, that's Vox in Spain, so it's far right. So it's right. Far right is in power and they work together with the bishop. Abortion cannot be a reality. We need to speak out in, against abortion because our country will be in ruins if women can carry out abortions. Now, we are many women together in uh, Stop Violencia. Um, but we notice that the far-right parties are trying to undermine the feminist parties. They say the same thing that we say, but they just change the content a little bit in order to undermine our message. And historically speaking, in Andorra, uh, 
we have been present in various revolutions and you might think that Andorra is a quite a liberal country, quite a free country, but this is not the case. It is quite a repressive, misogynist country. In Andorra, they say that our narrative is a lie, that this is defamation. While we hear the stories of many women every day, and we want, we need to fight for our rights. Thank you so much for listening to me. Gracias a ti, Vanessa. Well, thank you, Vanessa. Now, I believe that uh, after listening to Vanessa, we do have time for questions from the audience. So I don't know who wants to take the floor. There's a mic going around. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Carolina. Like Michelle, I'm part of the Solidaridad Sin Fronteras. It's a group of Spanish speaking women here in Brussels, and we want to, to make our fight visible in uh, our fight that we carry out in Latin America and also here in Brussels. Today, we're here in Belgium and uh, we want to talk about abortion because well that's what we've uh, what we've been mentioning we could talk about many issues today but that was take us too far i believe that it, here it is possible to carry out an abortion until 12 first weeks of your pregnancy so this could be because you you were on and sometimes um, sometimes people are unaware of, of a pregnancy but if you want to carry out an abortion after this, you have to go to the Netherlands, pay a thousand euros in travel cost and medical fares, etc. Now, there's been a law proposal, uh, been proposed many years in Belgium to raise the maximum date for 18 weeks after the pre 18 weeks of pregnancy. But this law proposal was not approved. This legislature, they're going to approve it for the next term because it was an exchange for an agreement within the current government coalition. So these women's rights are a exchange coin in political policies. So that's amazing. And then on the other hand, I wanted to give an example of Chile because I'm Chilean. In Chile, there was a, a, a new law proposal for a abortion, legal abortion in three cases. And, and now we have a new candidate for the presidency because there are presidential elections in Chile right now and the one of the candidates is far right candidate and one of his election promises is he said for example close the ministry for women he's going to to make 30,000 public employees redundant and he also wanted to scrap this law. And as Michel has said, on the one hand, we have new laws that guarantee us more rights. But at the same time, we see that extreme far right politicians are trying to take away these rights again. So we fought, we fought so many years to obtain these rights, but then other politicians try to take them away again. As you see in Chile, as we've heard from Andorra, from Mexico. So uh, it is a fight that we need to keep on fighting. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, hello, my name is Spiros, and I want to ask a question on uh, behalf of the youth of Syriza. Um, we share uh, common concerns because uh, in Greece uh, there has been uh, 12 cases of femicide the past year. So there is a woman being murdered every month uh, in Greece. Um, 
the lax punishments, police inaction, inadequate laws uh, allow this to happen. Uh, so there is systemic changes that uh, you have uh, talked about. Uh, and part of our party, Syriza, uh, has proposed a piece of legislation to include femicide as um, in the vocabulary of the criminal uh, law system in Greece. Uh, what I want to ask, and maybe this is a, a great question for, for Michelle, uh, to answer is uh, what uh, what do you see as being the role of uh, youth leftist organizations in promoting gender equality and and more specifically I, I, I'd like to hear uh, what can the youth uh, generations do uh, in order to promote to promote gender equality what is the most successful course of action uh, that has worked in practice in your countries thank you Well, I'm going to answer it in, in Spanish. I believe that meetings like today are very important, like we do in our, our, in our collective of feminists. We notice that feminism is something that is like a permanent education, we, we, education that we impart from women to women. I believe that in this room today we, have, we see mostly women, but we, and we need to have partners and men need to participate. They need to understand that they are in a privileged position and that we're all trying to create a dignified, just, a plural community. And it is important in this sense that men are standing strong together with us. So we need to, to, to pull everyone into this battle, all of the men that are around us that aren't a part of our demands, that aren't present here today, we should bring them all in this fight. I would like to say that during a meeting in during a meeting in Rome, there is a thirty thousand women demonstration against male violence against women against gender violence. It is a major success for us because it is raining. It is cold. Uh, there are also COVID restrictions in Rome, and even. Despite all these elements, it is uh, it is being very successful. I'm not there. I preferred to come here because this was very important, but it, it is a major success and we should be aware of that. I would like to say a couple of things about um, the killing of women in Italy and the right to abortion. In Italy, killing women, femicides, are not recognized by the courts. They always try to say that the, those who kill women do it in, um, in a flash of anger, on the spur of the moment, and they, um, they are hardly sentenced to anything or to very small penalties. But femicides have been on the rise in Italy. More and more women have been killed lately. In 2020, at least 100 women were killed. These women were killed by 
men, they knew they were their um, fiancé, their husbands, their brothers. They killed those women because women are still not considered to be human beings. They are considered to be those men's property. Uh, they are not seen as persons, so it is a very... Um, patriarchy-based um, conception of life, which is very deeply ingrained in the Italian culture. And it is a reason why this week um, against male violence against women or gender violence is very important. It is not only violence against women, but male and sexist violence against women. These are very essential characteristics. Then uh, my second point is about abortion. In Italy, we've had a law for the last 40 years, a very good law, actually, because it says that the final decision is the woman's decision. There is no um, other condition to be fulfilled, but that law is always being attacked, permanently being attacked, especially um, in the, the Italian health system, public health system, because in the law there is an article that says that um, doctors, physicians uh, can choose uh, um, conscientious objection. They can say, I am not carrying out this abortion because I object to it. I don't think um, I should do it. So in Italy, there are whole regions where it's not possible to get an abortion. The law is there, but it is not implemented. It's impossible to have it implemented because of that article. And that's makes it very difficult for women. There is also the organization that is related to um, the, uh, the extreme Catholic right, Pro Vita, and they um, campaign in the hospitals in order to um, discourage women from having abortions and that's also that also makes their situations very difficult and it's another contradiction because we have a very good law but it's um, hardly ever implemented we have very little time and i think now we should move on to the second part. Then we'll have another half hour for debate. And those who won't have had a previous opportunity to express themselves will have other, other opportunities. So let's move on to the second part about the policies that are meant to put an end. Oh. Mm. How this uh, domestic violence uh, is uh, present in Europe, and uh, we are going to see it. Uh, and of course, uh, you will describe different situations. We will see that there are different uh, uh, situations. And now we are going to give the floor to Mrs. Elena Contura. She belongs to uh, the Syriza um, Left Party. She's a member of the Commission uh, for Human Rights and Women's Rights. And she has participated in the report on the uh, um, guard rights uh, of children. Before uh, giving the floor to uh, Ms. Lena, I'm going to introduce the other colleagues who are going to be with us online. One of them is 
Ms. Clara Alonso. She is Director for Communications of the Ministry of Equality in Spain. And then we have Ms. Maria Caramesini, uh, who's a professor at the University Pantheon in Greece. She's doctor in economics. She's member of uh, the secretary of uh, Syriza, and uh, she's also a member of the feminist section. Elena, you have the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the invite, and I'm going to speak in English. Thank you for the invitation to attend. impact on women's life and their rights. The ongoing pandemic has uh, deepened uh, all inequalities and has widened the gender gap with uh, detrimental effect on women. On the pretext of the pandemic, dan dangerous um, ideologies uh, rooted in the extreme right political agenda, found ways to intensify attacks on the rights of women and girls and block advances in gender equality. The European Parliament, several uh, resolutions, has condemned such attempts and tried to address the human rights violation and the gradual uh, dismantling of women's uh, rights. The most obvious example is the persistence of six member states that refuse or postpone to ratify the Istanbul Convention as the first legally binding internationally legal text for combating gender-based violence for prevention and for the punishment of perpetrators. The EU institutions need to act faster and bolder in such urgent matters. And another example is also the unjustified delay in the ratification of the ILO Convention uh, 190 on eliminating violence and harassment at work. Yet, even within the European Parliament, collective response and pressure against these clear violations of rights are undermined by specific political groups that systematically place obstacles in the adoption of progressive reports. Such perceptions are far from the democratic values and principles that are the foundation of the European Union and the prerequisite of, uh, for, for healthy societies. To this end, I would like to inform you on our efforts at the European Parliament to address uh, deficiencies regarding women's rights and to push for more inclusive and fair policies that will empower women. I will touch upon some critical aspects of gender-based violence that I, I addressed through my initiative report as Rapporteur of the European Parliament on behalf of the FAM Committee regarding the impact of intimate partner violence and custody rights on women and children. This progressive groundbreaking report was adopted with vast majority by the European Parliament in October's plenary only lacking support by a mi minority of political groups with extremist views. Following its adoption, the report has been submitted as a resolution to the European Commission to be taken into consideration in its upcoming directive for combating gender-based violence in the EU. With this report, the European Parliament for the first time focuses not only on women, but also on children that have been traumatized uh, either as victims or as witnesses of such violence. We called on the European Commission and all member states to adopt a holistic European framework in support of the fundamental right of every woman and child to a life without violence. With my report, we ask foremost that the Istanbul Convention be swiftly ratified and implemented by the remaining six member states that have not yet done 
but also by the European Union. We also urge the Commission to include gender-based violence in the Eurocrimes list and to use this as a legal basis additionally to the Istanbul Convention for further binding measures and an holistic EU directive. We must act collectively without further delay to put an end to violence and crimes against women. One in three women has suffered physical or sexual abuse. One in five has been abused by her partner or her ex-partner, but two out of three do not file a complaint because of the fear, the shame, the blackmail, even the threats for their lives or their children's lives that they received from their abuser. Also, because of the lack of trust to the, author to the, to the authorities that they and another very important factor is economic dependency. In many cases, women are trapped in an abusive relationship because they have little or zero access to housing or income for themselves and their children. Still, when they manage to get away, the violence usually does not stop, even after the separation. During the pandemic and the lockdowns, domestic violence increased sharply as women and children found themselves in confinement at uh, home with their abuser. In some member states, though, reported incidents of domestic violence increased up to 60%. But even after lockdown was lifted, the abusers reacted even more violently because they lost the control they had gained. This is uh, reflected in the growing list of femicides and infanticides. We stated the need for a permanent mechanism that must be established to gender-based violence in times of crisis such as the pandemic. The pandemic has highlighted distortions and legislative gaps that pre-existed in addressing the full spectrum of domestic violence and especially in matters of custody. We called on the Commission and the Member States to ensure adequate and universal access for victims to structures uh, and support uh, services. And we asked for a permanent European mechanism to guarantee support to victims and combat gender-based violence in times of crisis, such as the pandemic. We also called for policies and measures for women's economic empowerment that will guarantee the victims of uh, violence their, uh, their immediate access to housing income and faster payment of benefits such as child support. In regards to children, child abuse is a key criterion in determining uh, custody. Yet, in cases of intimate partner violence, it is often ignored in several member states. The trauma experienced by the child is over often underestimated during the judicial uh, proceeding. So is the risk for the child and the mother to be repeatedly abused? This is why in my report, the European Parliament stated clearly that the failure to recognize and address incidents of intimate partner violence in determining child custody and visitation rights is a violation of the rights of women and children to a life without violence and is incompatible with the best interest of the child. The protection of women and children from violence and the best interest of the child must be paramount and should always take precedence over other criteria when establishing the arrangement for custody and visitation rights. And when the mother is a victim of violence, we consider that she should be granted full custody and that custody and visitation rights of the abusive partner should be revoked as this is the only way to protect her from further violence and secondary victimization. 
both parents must indeed participate actively in the life and upbringing of their, chi of their children, but not if it is against the best interest of the children. In any case, the European Parliament opposed to mandatory shared custody because each case must be ruled individually based on what is the best interest of the child as uh, defined in the International Convention on the Rights for, of the Child. Even more in cases with a history or even an indication of violence, shared custody decisions should be postponed until adequate investigation and risk assessments have been carried out. A further concern is the so-called parental alienation syndrome and similar concepts and terms. The scientific community does not recognize such terms and criticize them strongly. Still, they're of, often being used by abusive fathers as a strategy against the mother, <laughs> putting into, into question her parental skills, dismissing her word and um, disregarding the violence to which children are exposed. This is why in my report, the European Parliament rejects the use of the pseudo syndrome and calls on the member states to discourage or even to prohibit its use in court proceeding during the investigations to determine the existence of violence. For these reasons, we consider that custody and separation cases should be adjudicated exclusively from special courts and judges with the support of specialists such as forensic doctors, psychologists, and child psychologists, and pediatricians. We also propose that training must become mandatory for all personnel in the judicial system, in law enforcement, in forensic medical services, and healthcare professionals in relation to all forms of violence and its mechanism in handling such cases. Inadequate institutional response not only discourage uh, women from reporting their abuser, but often uh, compounds the trauma they suffer. It is unacceptable that we mourn the loss of women and children because the competent authorities failed to recognize the risk and the react timely. And this is why we also emphasize the need uh, of uh, enhanced programs focusing also on perpetrators with the aim of eliminating patterns of violent be behavior. In all prevention policies, action must be included that reduce exposure to violence during childhood and eliminate all forms sexism and gender stereotypes in every surrounding. The culture of uh, inspiring respect towards human rights and for every human being, regardless of their gender, is the only way of creating healthy relationships and prospects for true progress in our societies. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Pues vamos a darle la palabra. Thank you very much. Uh, now, now we are going to give the floor to Clara Alonso. Clara? Clara? Yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to speak in Spanish. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, all uh, the team uh, which has organized the forum uh, for uh, letting me know speak in front of you. I think that this is a feminist assembly and it has happened uh, in previous occasions. Uh, talking about these topics is uh, crucial. Uh, the international feminist movement is uh, crucial and we have to unite to uh, 
opposed to the far right, as Christina was mentioning earlier. I'm not going to focus on uh, domestic violence, although uh, I can answer you later on. Uh, I can tell you more details about the situation we have now in Spain. On the 25th of November, uh, which is the International Day for the Elimination of All uh, Types of Violence Against Women, uh, we uh, signed uh, a resolution against uh, domestic violence, which is a milestone in our country because uh, the vast majority of political forces, um, except from Vox, uh, sign it. And we have already allocated different uh, financial resources so that that all policies that we are implementing now in Spain are uh, effective. The Greek uh, colleague was uh, uh, talking about uh, the mandatory custody regime, uh, which is uh, which has already been banned in Spain. Um, we already know that uh, an offender is never going to be a good father. Well, maybe we can focus on this topic later on, but I would like to talk about something Christina suggested to me, which is uh, to uh, give an outlook uh, about uh, uh, childcare and protection that we are fostering uh, within the government. And why are we doing so? Because we think that uh, policies that uh, foster equality among women and men are very important. And so we can uh, tend towards uh, real uh, democratic uh, societies in our countries. These uh, policies, I, I, I'm sorry, but can you hear me? Because there is an echo. Can you hear me well? OK, yeah, I, I think that. There is an equal. Well, I was uh, referring to um, care policies that we are promoting uh, in our ministry. And uh, these policies are in line to the so called uh, the fourth wave feminist. Uh, by fourth wave feminist uh, is the feminist uh, movement uh, that uh, is um, uh, now. Uh, working across uh, Europe and uh, around the world. It's a feminist uh, movement which pays uh, attention to uh, the policies on gender violence, on the survivors and victims, that pays attention to recognition of rights, uh, and that uh, pays attention especially on the so-called redistribution policies, which is the basis of this paradigm paradigm for uh, the co-responsibility policies in order to eradicate uh, violence and all the types of discriminations that we women face uh, due to the fact that we are women. And uh, in order to uh, create these policies, uh, we uh, take uh, into account the distribution of uh, well, wealthness, uh, the distribution of time, because uh, women need time for themselves, and we also pay attention to the distribution of care. With uh, all the, these uh, three topics and uh, being uh, aware uh, of the situation we are living now in a neoliberal context, uh, we articulate uh, this uh, policy of childcare. And this policy of uh, care uh, wants to uh, strengthen uh, women's rights. Uh, in 2008, uh, the feminist movement uh, showed us that the crisis was not only a financial or an economic or, or labor crisis, but rather a multidimensional crisis. And within this crisis, uh, care was uh, playing a central role. And women were um, substantially uh, concerned by uh, this uh, care because they are uh, 
mainly the ones uh, who carry out uh, all uh, care activities. So this um, care uh, crisis uh, was affecting them and uh, was uh, undermining the distribution of tasks. As my Greek colleague was uh, saying, uh, one of the things that we have uh, um, seen uh, uh, during the pandemic is that women uh, uh, carry out uh, from the core tasks and uh, when we stop, everything stops. Uh, the world itself stops and uh, uh, in 2017 and in 2018, the Spanish uh, feminist movement uh, focused uh, on this matter through different interventions. In Spain, 90% of uh, the custodies uh, are given to uh, women. So uh, women have to quit uh, the labor market because they have to take care of children and also they uh, care uh, they they take care of of uh, elderly people we are the ones who mainly work part time because we have to uh, take care of our children we are the sector uh, uh, that uh, takes uh, uh, part-time contracts mostly uh, and 70 percent uh, sorry a uh, uh, um, substantial percentage of uh, women around the world uh, are informal workers. If uh, we could translate uh, this percentage uh, into money, the, uh, the sum would be very high. So we have to articulate uh, different uh, public policies to solve this problem. And we have to adopt a new vision a vision that uh, we are currently fostering uh, in uh, my ministry. We are uh, promoting uh, some initiatives uh, uh, for women uh, in order to allow them to uh, uh, work and find a balance between work and care. We want to consider that all these uh, care activities are essential for life and that they have to be uh, highlighted and uh, um, paid. And in the, these terms, uh, we have launched a plan uh, for, for responsibility. This is a plant uh, aiming to foster co-responsibility or the shared responsibility. So we are trying to change the paradigm of care. And the first principle laying, uh, the first underlying principle is that uh, we are not talking about who takes care of children and elderly people more or less, if we are talking about men or women, but rather that this uh, must be a policy and uh, that uh, care uh, don't belong to the uh, private uh, sphere, but rather that the states uh, uh, have to play a major role because uh, care is essential for uh, um, the uh, for life so um, for the moment we have uh, some um, uh, financial allocations uh, for uh, care but uh, this is a minor policy this is what we call a seed policy, which allows us uh, to uh, foster the vision I have just described. Uh, care uh, can be taken 
into account by uh, the public services in Spain. And yes, we know that in Spain uh, uh, we have a solid uh, healthcare system, although um, now it's, uh, it has been undermined by the crisis and other factors. And yes, we know that uh, we can go to the doctor if uh, we have a headache. And now we are promoting that uh, a woman who needs some time to carry out uh, different activities and not only uh, uh, taking care of, of children, she can go to uh, the healthcare service or to other public spaces uh, to, uh, uh, to leave uh, uh, her children. So now we are uh, uh, creating different uh, spaces and we would like that the state uh, um, monitors uh, uh, these spaces. And, uh, on the other side, we are trying to articulate uh, public policies on uh, care in Spain. We want to recognize uh, the right to uh, uh, care as a right, as a fundamental right. And we want to deploy other rights uh, so that uh, women can uh, carry out a decent, uh, fair life, that uh, they are independent uh, from a, an economic point of view and so on. Well, I don't know uh, if you are uh, up to date, but uh, in Spain, uh, um, both spouses uh, can uh, have uh, the same time uh, for uh, maternity and paternity leave. Uh, and concretely, they uh, can have a 16-week maternity and paternity leave. Apart from this, uh, we are trying to ratify the Convention uh, 189 uh, on the domestic workers because uh, they uh, are subject to more precarious uh, working conditions. And uh, besides, uh, we want to launch uh, national systems for care. We want uh, that uh, this uh, national system works as uh, the education system or the health system works in Spain. So in a nutshell, we want to launch uh, all these uh, initiatives and uh, the uh, care policy and uh, to promote the implementation of other international and European policies for gender equality. We want that women can have time for themselves because as a result, they will work better. They will have better working conditions. This is what we are doing uh, in the government in Spain, and uh, we are aiming to promote care as a fundamental right. Uh, care is key for uh, caregivers, uh, for experts, for professionals, and for those people who need some care uh, throughout their lives. Um, we all know that at some point in life uh, uh, are in need of, of care when we are young, when we are uh, little. And if you have, well, this is all for now. If you have any doubts, please let me know. Thank you very much, Clara. And now we have with us uh, uh, Mr. M Mrs. Maria Caramesini. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, hello to everybody. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Is it okay? Can you hear me? 
Uh, I have prepared some slides, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I I'm not sure that uh, the organizers are able to upload them. Uh, can you upload them, please? Okay, but okay. Is it okay? Can you? Sí, puedes compartir tu pantalla. Yes, you can share your screen. If you have this possibility, you can share your screen. Ah, okay. you can share your screen, and uh, in case uh, it's not working, the screen, uh, the sharing, uh, we can we can put the slides from here. So it is better if you share your screen. Uh, okay, I can I can do it. I will do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I will uh, my, my talk will is very complementary to those uh, of uh, Elena and Clara. Um, I will speak on the gender consequences of COVID-19 crisis and the feminist agenda for a sustainable future in Europe. Um, so I'm not going to speak on Greece or in Spain, but uh, for, I'm going to speak on Europe as a whole. Uh, and the European Union uh, uh, in particular. So I will start by saying that uh, uh, the, the, I will start by listing the well-known gendered consequences of uh, lockdown and confinement measures. Um, the big rise in unpaid care work, uh, the uh, work-life balance problems that have increased for women still working outside home or working remotely from home. Uh, we very well know that uh, there has been a big rise in gender-based domestic violence everywhere. And uh, more female workers than men were exposed to COVID-19, work intensity and long hours in open workplaces. Um, but contrary to what have been uh, the initial forecasts on a great uh, negative impact uh, of the crisis on women, uh, the, these forecasts have not been confirmed regarding job losses and unemployment, since uh, male employment has decreased slightly more than female employment during uh, the crisis. And uh, male and female unemployment were equally affected. So we, we cannot observe, we have not observed any substantial difference between men and women regarding job losses and uh, a rise of unemployment during uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, what has the pandemic revealed from a feminist perspective? Uh, the first uh, thing that it has revealed is the centrality of caregiving for social reproduction and the immense value of care work for, for society. Uh, the second thing it has revealed is the scope and continuum of caregiving, including healthcare, social and personal care and education of all those in need of assistance and in a state of uh, dependency. Not only children, the frail elderly or the disabled, but also the victims of violence, the homeless, the drug addicts, the refugees and other vulnerable groups. So there has been a revelation of the, of the, the great scope of uh, caregiving in our society and the need for care. The third thing the pandemic has revealed is the importance of the welfare state and the public provision of care for ensuring public health and the right of citizens to be cared, as well as for women's engagement in paid work, their economic independence and gender equality. The fourth thing the pandemic has revealed is the need for a more equal sharing of care and domestic work between men and women and to combat gender-based domestic violence. Last but not least, 
the pandemic has revealed the need for the EU to build a more universal social protection floor, less dependent upon past employment records or employment status. Now, let us turn to, the, to a left feminist agenda for the social ecological transformation of Europe. Since we are, there is a great debate in the European Union uh, for, the, for the recovery. And uh, the, the, we have many tools put in place, the uh, recovery fund. Uh, we are debating about the use of the resources at the European level in order to build a, 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 a more sustainable future for Europe. So what is the left feminist agenda for this transformation of Europe after the end of the pandemic? The, the core component of the, of the left feminist agenda is to establish a universal right to care and to be cared. That, that is to establish a caring economy and uh, excuse me, a caring society by boosting a care economy. Uh, so I think that the European Forum should endorse the demand of the European Women's Lobby for a European care deal next to the European Green Deal. So how do left feminists propose to create a care economy? Through five main uh, um, lines of uh, policy uh, policy guidelines by large public investment in social infrastructure, by job creation in health and care sectors, by the reevaluation and wage rises in care occupation, in care occupations, by decent work and wages of care workers and by combating undeclared domestic care work, and by the recognition and equal sharing of unpaid work between men and women. So these are the five lines of uh, policy intervention that uh, should uh, be able to create a care economy, or at least boost a care economy in our uh, societies. Uh, and why do we need to boost uh, the care economy? Uh, in order to promote gender equality, in order to tackle the crisis of care, and in order to prepare for future health crisis. Uh, this is, uh, the, it, it, to tackle the crisis of care is very, very important uh, since we are living in aging societies and the crisis of care existed before the pandemic, but the pandemic has added an extra argument, an additional argument by revealing, as I said before, and I presented before, that, the, the, that care is not only about children, uh, the elderly and the disabled, but it's, it's about uh, uh, very many, many groups in our society and that every person at a certain point of its life it will be in need of care. So thank you very much. And I hope that we will have a very good debate on that if we have some, some time to answer to questions. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Pues ahora sí, volvemos a abrir el debate. Eh, Quienes queráis. All right, so I suggest that uh, we uh, should now open the debate. Please ask for the floor if you would like to intervene. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for organizing this Women's Assembly. Thank you very much to you, Christina, for your hard work. I'd like to come back on some key issues raised during this assembly. And then I think that we should maybe make two suggestions. And I'm speaking on behalf of the French Communist Party. Well, as we are here in Brussels, I would like to let you know that tomorrow at 12.30 there will be a mobilization against uh, gender-based violence here in Brussels, in the Mont des Arts. So you are kindly invited to join those of you who will still be in Brussels tomorrow. Uh, recently, and I know that around the 25th of November, we've seen mobilizations a little bit everywhere throughout Europe and namely in France. Uh, last Saturday, we had between 50 and 60,000 uh, persons who took to the streets to fight against those gender-based violence acts and to ask for, form, for more means to fight against those types of violence. In France, we would like to have one billion dedicated to this fight against gender-based violence, and we would like to have a framework uh, legislation uh, with the necessary means uh, to uh, eliminate this uh, gender-based violence. I'd like to come back on the various uh, issues raised because I believe that be it at EU level or at the international level, as uh, women, we face the same realities. And we have just uh, uh, talking about the right to health. And I remember that the founder of uh, the social security in France, he was a communist minister establishing the right to health for all, he said regarding the social aki, I'm not talking about social aki, but about a, a conquest, because this is a fight. This is an ongoing fight. And I think that this sentence is extremely topical, and it applies to women's rights also. It's not so much about uh, talking the achievements, but rather what we have conquered, because we know that uh, the uh, far right forces never stop this fight either. And we see with the current situation, the current uh, harmful situation in France, we see and we hear uh, racist uh, speeches and narrative, uh, macho uh, speeches, and uh, those uh, narratives are used by the reactionary forces. So this is one of the key problems we face now in France with the rise of uh, the far right and the uh, reactionary forces. They are opposed to women, uh, how they should behave in the the society, what they should wear, what is their position in the society, the fact that they are no longer free to decide for themselves and for their bodies. So I think that this is really striking. And we have seen this right from the start of the pandemic with this right to health. This is a basic right, a fundamental right. And we know that women have been in the front line. We know that uh, women had the most uh, uh, precarious uh, jobs. Uh, 70% of uh, the health sector is made up of women in France. And of course, uh, they have been uh, the victims of forced teleworking, partial unemployment, or um, precariousness, and also decreased uh, wages with a double burden because, of course, they had uh, to look after their family and the children, and they also had to think about their profession. So that's the reason why in France, for for the first time, the wage gap has increased once again, and it amounts to 16.8% now in France. So I have to say that this uh, gap is increasing. And since the 3rd of November now, uh, women are going to work for free versus men for the same type of jobs. And I'm saying this because this is our fight. And um, this feminist fight cannot be separated from the fight of classes. It cannot be separated from the fight against uh, the capitalism and neoliberal forces. 
Uh, it's not about saying that those are individual rights, and this is what we hear from the neoliberals. We have to have the proper means. We have been talking about public services. We've been talking about the public health. Of course, this is fundamental, uh, this idea of care, but it involves education as well, because we know that if we do not have a proper education, if we cannot educate the youngest women, will have to take care of that. And then you have the right to transport, the right to mobility, the right, the right to housing. If we do not have a special policies allowing us to have access to that, women will be penalized uh, even more. Because, of course, they usually have uh, the uh, underpaid uh, jobs. So. This is not the first time that this women assembly is gathering, and we often say that we have to fight against those inequalities. We have to fight gender-based violence and machism, and we have to embark upon those fights. And at the same time, we have to work on women's emancipation. I believe that throughout the world, we need a larger synergies. For instance, on the International Day of Women, the eighth of March, why not organizing joint activities on this day? And I also believe that we should put forward joint statements. This is paramount. As this is a European forum, why not exchanging, exchanging good practices? I have carefully listened to our Spanish comrades. I know that recently, over the last six months, you have been able to implement progressive policies, and this is precisely what we try to do. We try to go and see those municipalities where we could have some influence. So we need more exchanges on best practices. We advocate for the most favor, the most favored close at EU level. And I believe that there could be a consensus, at least I hope so, that we could have a consensus between the left forces and progressive forces at EU level. And this will be achieved if we can have the right balance of power. We are convinced that this feminist fight nowadays is really a fight that is bringing together uh, the highest number of people. This is important if we want to progress in this avenue and if we want to go for more social progress for everyone. Thank you very much. Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, soy Ana. Eh, soy de Good afternoon. I'm Ana from Madrid. I come from Spain and I'm also from the Communist Party and from Izquierda Unida. So I would like to thank you and all the panelists for their um, presentations. And I see that what's happening in Spain also happens in other countries. These fora are extremely important because we, we realize that what we experience in our country um, is something that happens everywhere, those attacks against women. The, the courts which don't really punish those who have uh, um, been responsible for violence against women. I always think that it's because of their um, Franco legacy in Spain, but I see that elsewhere it's the same situation. Women earn lower wages, not because we're less competent, but just because we're women. Poverty is uh, has a woman's face. Most issues were faced with in Spain and other countries, and the, the further south we go, Africa, Latin America, well, African women are the first ones which are, who are completely forgotten. We have, we still have the feeling we have privileged as compared to those women from the south of the world. But what we have, we have conquered it by, by fighting. And even though what we have 
uh, obtained legally, the legal framework, or the legal provisions in favor of equality are only formal. And that equality is not a reality. But we have to join forces, men and women, if we want to reach true gender equality. I have two questions um, or comments. One of the basic topics, in my opinion, and I'm not going to repeat what the French comrade said. I totally agree with what she said. But what can we do in schools, at school? Because to, in order to promote gender equality, it, we should start educating the children from birth. In, from kindergarten. We have um, an extreme right-wing party uh, in Spain which is preventing any form of sex education. And we also have a, a subject matter which is still taught, which is religion in Spain, and it is terribly um, alienating. It conditions our children. So what can, how can we make sure that gender equality is instilled from birth or from a very early age? And how can we um, get the help of healthcare professionals to, as, to identify, to screen abuses, ill treatments? to make sure that the ill treatments of women are um, identified before they get murdered. How can we find the right way to protect women and children and to make sure they're killers um, are really punished, to make sure they really pay for that, they're really sentenced by the courts. In, in case of, in, in the cases of rape, uh, sex, sexual abuse, I remember a demonstration that took place on in the 80s. It wasn't on, on a, a 26th, 25th of November, and we all wore very short mini skirts uh, during that demonstration because in a company, the, the company owner had raped one of the workers, uh, and the judge said that anyway, her skirt was too short. And he said the solution, well, is the solution that women should stop wearing miniskirts? No, I don't think that's the case. Men should be educated so they, they don't become rapists. In Valencia, two rapists were uh, absolved. The, the girl was 13 years old. She said that she had a relationship with a 20-year-old boy. She's raped by her so-called fiancé and his cousin. And the judge said that she was mature enough, that she had the same level of maturity as the 20-year-old boy. So what can we do to prevent such things from happening? Uh, it's a long process, but I think that training, educating is essential. We should really educate people, women and men, about gender equality in order to uh, conquer gender equality and solve or prevent all those issues. Thank you. We still have time for one question. Thank you. I would like to pick up on what you've said. And, I, and well, I would like to thank you because at the beginning of the year, I lost a friend who fell a victim to violence. So I just wanted to thank you for what you said. I had a small question, um, and I would like to give a, an example to introduce it. I come from Paris. In Paris, we have a group that is present in all major cities in France. It's called Nemesis. It is a group, a grouping of women who claim to be um, um, femo-nationalists. 
So the movement, that grouping is present in most big cities and they rally a growing, well, the movement rallies a growing number of young women. They are anti-immigration, uh, anti-abortion, they are um, Islamophobic, they don't want women's to have, women to have their rights. So what would be your advice as a um, progressive organization which we represent and also personally, me for example, as a man, what strategy would you have advise I should adopt in order to counteract this movement and particularly this grouping which is growing day by day? Thank you. I'm going to give my opinion about what you've just asked. I think that the contradictions of what they fight for uh, should be made visible. So they have a so-called feminist narrative, and it's an extreme uh, or a far-right strategy which is extremely dangerous for us and for our rights. And uh, it's it very pervasive, and it, they are contaminating a large um, number of young people. It is the reason why I think it's very important to make their contradictions visible. It's very important to develop a rights-based common agenda that can be compared, that, that should be comparable with their anti-feminist agenda, which goes clearly against women's rights and which aims at defeating the conquests of women. The 8th of March is an example of how we can make those conditions visible when we um, raise the profile of the care work, for example. We, we, can, we can show clearly who's attacking us and who's um, trying to prevent us from having our rights respected. We can make visible a system that hates us, a system that is uh, misogynist and that uh, wants to exploit us. So, for example, in the demonstrations of the 8th of March in 2018, we showed clearly this criminal alliance between patriarchy and the capitalist system. We should raise awareness about this um, attempt at exploiting us, those attempts at discriminating against us women. And that's the way, that's the way explaining, mobilizing, raising the profile, raising awareness. That's the way we should take. And in the mobilizations, all those people who took part in those mobilizations in 2008, well, nowadays, these, these people who took part in those mobilizations in, the, in those demonstrations don't believe these false feminist narratives anymore. So we should keep mobilizing people. We should keep organizing feminist strikes on the 8th of March. That's my opinion. That's what I believe. I would also like to take the floor for a couple of seconds to answer Chiara. She asked a question about uh, integral sex education. May I? Yes. She spoke about what to do if the institutions are not able to provide a, a lay, scientifically proven um, and politically correct um, sex education. So, Kiara Alonso spoke about a multidimensional crisis, and within that multidimensional crisis, we should play our role. We should play a prominent role. And uh, 
we should say that as the institutions are not doing their duty, we are going to lead a revolution. We are going to cross borders, to cross oceans in order to um, do what the institutions should do. In each one of our constituencies, um, we are not going to uh, obey strictly the legal framework in our, frameworks in our countries. We are just going to keep claiming our rights, whatever those legal frameworks. I think we are having a dialogue nowadays with young people. I think that young people um, nowadays have uh, education and training um, in all sorts of aspects um, within reach thanks to the new technologies and fortunately we were not that lucky and um, still nowadays not all women have access to technologies and to that vast amount of knowledge and so we should really uh, take the time to have conversations with uh, young people in order to, and, and we should ask them questions and not necessarily uh, give them all the answers. First of all, uh, hear them, hear their concerns, and then maybe try to respond to those concerns together. So when we are with young people or children worried about fully-fledged sex education, we should realize that sometimes we are with people um, which are being educated. We should not consider that there are people who are completely ignorant about those um, those topics. And. Well, and, and these, um, this process of being trained, being educated, will also be enriched by what, by what we can give them. Thank you very much. May I have a few seconds as well? I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Así, pues damos la palabra, sí. Yes? Yes. Sí, nos oye. Ah. Sí, sí, puedes hablar. For, ah, okay. For, for me, go yes, ahead. You can talk. Yes, I can talk. I think that we can, we should come out with some uh, proposals, and I have put forward um, a proposal for the European Forum to support uh, the call by the European Women's Lobby uh, for for a European Care Deal uh, that would allow uh, to bring about a care economy to invest to make public investment in social infrastructure for care all over Europe in all and have the means the resources to do this uh, f to bring about it to boost the care economy the care economy is is about uh, making these investments in order to to support a, a, a universal right to care and be cared uh, and be cared. Uh, so we should come out with some uh, strong proposal, not uh, end up this assembly without having a strong proposal for the European Forum as a whole. Uh, and we have a vision for a caring society and we should put forward that it is, it is not only good for gender equality, but for society as a whole, for the, for the values that we are supporting not only for gender equality. Gender equality goes along with other uh, uh, broader values and the vision for a better world. And a, a caring society is this, this new vision that a feminist agenda can, can, can bring about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I think that we should agree on that before leaving uh, this assembly. Bueno, al, al inicio, al inicio comentaba... 
At the beginning of this session, uh, we were uh, explaining that uh, this assembly's goal was to launch a campaign to oppose uh, to the rise of the far right and the right because they have an agenda which is uh, contrary to our values at the local, national, at the international level. This is an anti-feminist agenda and uh, with this agenda they want to uh, um, grab the rights that we have uh, gradually conquered. And I think that um, our agendas are very important for uh, launching, to the, for the launch of this campaign. And uh, the call for care is a, a way to face all these problems. We are talking about an agenda in which uh, the investment in care is included. We want uh, to be heard. We don't want to be mistreated. We don't want to be harassed or abused across Europe. As I was mentioning earlier, we have to face contradictions uh, that uh, these uh, two agendas are going to experience. And I think that uh, with all conclusions drawn from this session, we can create an agenda, an agenda which highlights all contradictions, uh, um, the contradictions that uh, we have uh, with uh, this uh, right and far right, which is uh, um, contrary to us, uh, that hate us, uh, that uh, is uh, misogyny. And so I would like to uh, compile all proposals as well as the proposal made by our colleague. I think that these all proposals aim to uh, give visibility to the mistreatment that we suffer, as it's the case in Andorra or in Mexico or in Argentina, uh, as it's the case in so many places in which uh, the right and far right parties are powerful and can uh, decide over our lives. The campaign, and it's my guess, uh, is going to uh, echo all these proposals. And it happened uh, back uh, on the 8th of March. On that day, we were promoting uh, the access to care and to life. And um, to conclude, I would like to uh, thank you all for your contributions to the panelists for such excellent uh, descriptions and uh, to all of you, all those uh, who are here because they have contributed to a better campaign. We are going to need your support, uh, your help uh, from our countries. Thank you very much. And uh, we are still fighting. Bye-bye.